Hello, and uh, I'm Dr. Timothy Kells. Um, thank you. I was not naval, it was Army, but I appreciate the, uh, the plug there. Um, so uh, I practice here in Scottsdale in sunny Arizona, and I'm going to talk today about uh, cutaneous cancers of the head and neck, something that really affects quite a, uh, quite a few providers here in Arizona because we see an aging population in a very sunny environment, and so this is something that we have to deal with um, very regularly. So I have no financial disclosures. So today, really, we're going to discuss the differential diagnosis for skin cancers and, as well, the treatment for one of the more feared ones, malignant melanoma. And then, lastly, go through um, the general principles of surgery for skin cancers, as well as adjuvant therapies, which include radiation and systemic therapy. So um, skin cancer is the most common cancer in the world. It affects 3.5 million Americans every year or more. It might be 4.4 this last year. And... um, uh, uh, 100,000 of those will end up be, being uh, melanoma, which is the very feared um, skin cancer, due to its um, risk of potential um, spread and metastasis. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer over age 70, and that's to the tune of about $8 billion or more in skin cancer therapy. There are many risk factors. Um, uh, generally, light skin and sun exposure, as well as age, are the big, the big risk factors, but UVA and UVB rays... Um, uh, light skin, uh, blue-green eyes, blonde-red hair, a uh, large number of moles, really s- multiple sunburns, and multiple sunburns at a young age, uh, under age 16, increased at risk. Um, indoor tanning, which we'll talk about in a second, and I want to make a special note to immunosuppression. We're in an age and era with biologic therapies that have really changed the treatment for a lot of autoimmune diseases, and this has also accompanied uh, organ transplant, and so immunosuppressants are very prevalent, and this raises the risk of skin cancers, creating a whole new category of patients that we need to watch very closely. So indoor tanning, I just think it's worth mentioning. Um, A lot of people like to prep for that summer suntan, and um, UV devices have been uh, followed for years for uh, uh, sun uh, sun tanning and have shown uh, to be a high carcinogen. Um, They're a group one carcinogen by the World Health Organization, and um, in some countries, they're actually uh, banned under age 18. Um, the Swedish did a study showing a direct correlation with sun, uh, uh, um, indoor tanning and, and skin cancer development. And currently, there are about 420,000 cases per year directly linked to sun tanning in the, in the tanning booths and 10,000 melanomas. So the differential diagnosis includes basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. That's about 95% of all skin cancers. Um, the remaining 5% include melanoma, which is a big component, and then a much smaller component of the sarcomas and Merkel cell carcinoma and sebaceous carcinoma. So basal cell is around 2 million cases per year in the United States. It's usually a, a raised lesion with what we describe as pearly telangiectasias uh, and rolled borders. Sometimes it can be kind of a scaly, reddish, uh, shiny scar. It's typically treated with surgery and very effectively. Um, and um, there are um, other adjuvant therapies like radiation that's really reserved for patients who are very poor surgical uh, candidates or have an area that is highly sensitive like the medial canthus of the eye. So we said this is a surgical disease. The five different types include superficial, morpheiform, nodular, infiltrative, and fibroepithelioma. The most common is the superficial, and um, this um, occurs about 80% of its uh, prevalence in the head and neck. Um, Typically, you'll hear about these cancers in the head and neck, and, um, and they'll be very focused on an area around the eyes, nose, and mouth that we call the H zone, kind of right across the eyes, down the middle, and across the mouth. It includes the ears, and those are very sensitive areas because they don't have a lot of skin to give when you're removing them, and so you have to be a little cognizant to function and form. And so in the 1930s, Frederick Mose came up with a technique called Mose micrographic surgery, where the skin is resected in a um, kind of a beveled fashion and evaluated with horizontal uh, pathologic slices that allow for a little bit better um, correlation of resection with the uh, skin cancer's uh, presence. And uh, with that, they've had um, around 98 to 99% um, 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 cure rate with uh, Mohs in in kind of typical cases and up to 94% in recurrent cases. So you'll commonly hear Mohs micrographic surgery when you're talking about resection of basal cell in those sensitive areas. It does not, basal cell does not typically go to the lymph nodes, and uh, there are alternative therapies like radiation 
Um, there's also systemic therapy for people who do develop a more severe form of basal cell where it's more recurrent and extensive. And it uses uh, um, a uh, immunologic uh, checkpoint um, called the sonic hedgehog pathway. My kids would love that. And um, there's a drug out, uh, uh, um, Vesdigimib, it's very hard to say, um, that um, will help uh, in some of those patients. So this is a kind of a typical patient who's been um, out in the sun for most of his life and develops a lesion on his nose, goes to see his doctor who says we should get a biopsy of that and sends it to the dermatologist. Dermatologist says, wow, this is a basal cell carcinoma <clears throat> and we need to... Um, to uh, take this off with surgery. I recommend a Mohs micrographic surgeon so that a small defect can be um, made and we can have a little bit more room for reconstruction. There's several ways to reconstruct, including a skin graft, moving tissue around called adjacent tissue arrangement, or even moving tissue into an area called a uh, flap rotation. So in this one, we use a bilobed flap where we had a, a defect that showed um, a good portion of the tip of his nose is now exposed. But this gentleman wanted a one-stage procedure, one and done, um, and have the sutures removed and be done with this. So we used this um, bilobe flap where a, a, a segment that's about the size of the defect but a little bit smaller is moved into the defect. And then a smaller segment is moved into that uh, empty space, which we can see next. And then closed. And um, after sutures removed and a little bit of time of healing, I think this was about a, a three-week or four, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a six-week follow-up on the on the, uh, on the last, on the last uh, picture, you see a, a pretty good result. The second most um, common cancer is squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, and uh, it encompasses about 750,000 cases in the United States per year. It's usually like a scaly patch that begins to bleed or a sore that won't heal. Um, it usually is a progression from actinic keratosis, which I'll have a, slide, a picture of in the next slide. And in invasive squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, you'll see keratinocytes invading with keratin pearls and nuclear pleomorphism. So here's a gentleman um, on the upper slide that may have started with a kind of a scaly plaque on the lower slide until it became kind of um, 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 ulcerated and scabby and then began to have these edges that showed that there's clearly something wrong. 97% of these are uh, progressions of actinic keratosis and a, um, a P53 mutation. Um, in general, um, the radiation from the sun injures the DNA and causes a uh, cross-coupling of DNA strands and then um, um, uh, injures tumor suppressor genes. And eventually, the cells are allowed to start growing out of control. This particular one, squamous cell, like basal cell, is most often treated with surgery. And again, you can think of Mohs micrographic surgery in that special H zone across the eyes, down the nose, around the mouth, including the ears. And like basal cell, for primary tumors, radiation is, a, is, a, is an option for very sensitive areas like the medial canthus of the eye or in somebody who can't have surgery. Unlike basal cell, you have to worry about lymph nodes in squamous cell carcinoma. And in fact, um, we talk a lot about melanoma uh, because we have about 100,000 cases per year here in the United States and, and around 7,000 deaths. And with squamous cell, we have almost the same amount of deaths every year and it's really not given the same kind of fear and, and attention um, all the time. So you want to do a very good clinical examination on your patient and make sure that there isn't any lymph nodes involved, um, there isn't any uh, involvement. Sometimes uh, nerves will get involved and you'll feel like a band of, of scar tissue that is actually um, um, tumor growing underneath the skin along a, a nerve. And so uh, we want to evaluate their lymph nodes, which may include imaging, and then it may include what's called the sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is evaluating the lymph node that is the first bus stop out of that region for our lymphatic drainage system. Um, sentinel lymph node biopsy for squamous cell carcinoma is really indicated if these features on the uh, right have, you have more than two of those. So uh, a fairly big size with a fairly deep invasion, nerve or vascular invasion, and aggressive features. And then I come back to those immunocompromised patients. They're kind of a setup that their immune system isn't checking what's what's happening all the time. So here we have a gentleman who had kind of an interesting story, which I've heard before, which is he had an injury. In his case, he fell, scraped his nose, and while the rest of his face healed just fine, his nose started growing uh, an extra um, a bit of tissue. And so here you can see this exophytic hypertrophic tissue extending from his right, uh, right side of his nose. And you might look at this and say, well, wow, why did he wait so long? But 
uh, it grew really fast. It was about two to three months, and he was already, uh, within a month and a half, he was already seeking care, going, this thing is not healing, and it's getting a lot worse. The biopsy showed squ uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and a Mohs micrographic surgeon resected this, which included a full thickness defect of his nose. Um, this is a big problem because the inside lining is gone, the cartilaginous framework is gone, and the outside lining is gone. So we first divide the nose uh, and any area of, of, of a defect into the subunits that seem to be affected, specifically the nose. We were looking at the ALAR subunit here and half of the tip subunit. And we marked out what we will need to do to reconstruct and have it look uh, appropriate. Then I took lining from the inside of the nose called the mucoperichondrial flap from the septum, and I flipped that out to line the inside of the nose, took cartilage from his left ear, which is seen on the top left, as a reconstruction of the ala, and then I used skin from his forehead, still attached to a blood supply to cover the nose, and now it has a blood supply for all that stuff that is being put in there to heal. And here we see him with, and you have to really counsel them well, that this is gonna be a very odd three weeks of their life. And um, we counseled him that he's gonna be this pedicle with all this soft tissue attached, and um, I was very generous because I did not want that soft tissue did not have a blood supply, so I left a little bit thicker pedicle than I normally would, and um, left it for three weeks, and then separated those pedicles, reinserted everything where it's supposed to go, and he ended up with the result he has there. Now, he was so happy, because usually there's another stage and, and a step to reconstructing this, and he said, Doc, I want to ride my horses, and he uh, um, did not come back for that second stage, but did keep in touch with me, telling me everything was healing very well, and he was super happy he could breathe, he felt like he looked like he did before as close as, as to be expected, and, um, and he was back to uh, his activities. So this is a gentleman with a scalp carcinoma who um, started as an actinic keratosis and fairly quickly began bleeding, and he would scratch at it, and it's not exactly in a place in your body that you can stare at, and it began to grow, and eventually he was seen um, by a dermatologist and recommended to a Mohs micrographic surgeon. Um, we discussed um, a sentinel lymph node biopsy on him, and he elected not to do it. And we also discussed a reconstruction uh, without skin grafting. So in this uh, uh, slide, he had had the tumor resected, and we used a bipedical flap to close and reconstruct that area. And you can see it takes um, um, quite a bit of movement to get tissue to close in the uh, top of the scalp. Here's a gentleman whose ear had a lot of sun exposure, and he grew this lesion that wasn't healing. It was kind of scabbing and ulcerating. And so, uh, you know, we did a biopsy and knew it was squamous cell carcinoma, and we talked about Mohs, but he kind of wanted a, a, a one-and-done approach. And so I took him to the operating room, uh, resected the, the tumor, which is very visibly, had very visible borders here, and then um, sent it to the pathologist while he's still asleep and, and cleared the margins, and um, then attempted our reconstruction. And so um, my plan was to uh, remove a little bit of the, the purple area, so that we could get the um, helix, which is the outside areas of the ear, to retouch in the middle. And so you can see that we resected a bit of that tissue and then advanced those flaps back together, and he had a very normal-looking ear but a much smaller ear. Um, it's about two-thirds the size of the other ear, but because the ear isn't usually stared at, both ears at the same time, most people never notice, and he was very happy. And after the suture removal, back to his dermatologist. Um, Lip is a very um, unique area that I think ne needs mentioning because the lip has two types of skin, keratinizing and non-keratinizing skin at a junction called the vermilion border. Um, the lip uh, of the upper lip will typically have basal cell and more on the keratinizing part. And on the lower lip, it will often have squamous cell carcinoma if a skin cancer develops. And that's usually on the junction of that keratinizing, non-keratinizing part. I already told you that squamous cell has more propensity to go to lymph nodes. And so we do have to worry about that. And with lip involvement, we also want to be very um, cognizant of oral competence when we remove something and put it back together. But we want to be watching to consider um, indications for that lymph node biopsy. We now do sentinel lymph node biopsies, like we discussed earlier. Um, and um, usually we're looking for a three millimeter depth based upon various studies. There are studies that mention six, four. I think three is one that I've settled on as being uh, as inclusive to most of the people who are going to be at risk for a lymph node and um, overall 11 to 12% incidence that a lymph node will be involved. Evaluating that would allow us to add other treatments such as radiation. So here's a lady who had a lip biopsy showing squamous cell carcinoma. Um, again, um, this time we were gonna do a kind of a one and done approach, 
I uh, resected it, sent it to the pathologist to make sure I cleared the margins, and then did a W to Y closure. This gentleman had a basal cell carcinoma of the upper lip, and uh, although we didn't have to worry about lymph nodes, you can see that it did lead to quite a resection, quite an area of defect, and there's just not enough tissue there to just pull it back together and close it. So I had to add tissue from somewhere else, and I wanted to use tissue that looked like for like, so I used his bottom lip, and still anchored, you can see it on the right side, still anchored to the bottom lip, he, it is inserted on the upper lip. Three weeks later, I separate that connection because it's established its own blood supply, and um, he lived out of state. Uh, he, would, he drives back about every six months or, or nine months for me to take a look at it, and it's doing great. And he's very happy and has good oral competence. There's no muscle in that flap, but eventually um, muscular fibers kind of grow in and create a scar band, and there is some movement. It just doesn't quite move like a sneer like I'm doing right now. So this is the one that gets most of the media attention and is certainly um, where a lot of work has been done. Malignant melanoma affects 100,000 people per year in the United States alone, um, and that is growing at four to five incidents, or four to five percent per year, with up to 7,000 deaths. In stage three and four, um, in years past in the 70s, if you had stage four disease, you usually had less than one year to live. Um, most malignant melanomas are found um, in a very thin, superficial presentation, and so there's a 93% survival in uh, over five years for most melanomas, but we focus on the ones who have the higher risk, which is the ones that fell into that other 7% category. We're looking for a lesion that's often pigmented. It doesn't always have to be, but often pigmented with um, asymmetry of that pigmented mole, some color variation within the mole. It's growing, it's changing, um, and, uh, and um, evolving over time. So malignant melanoma falls into uh, five, uh, six categories, um, and the superficial spreading is the most common, followed by probably lentigo maligna, which lentigo maligna is melanoma in the skin, and then when it goes through, it becomes malignant melanoma, which is lentigo maligna melanoma, just for providers to know that distinction, because they'll see it sometimes as lentigo maligna, and then lentigo malignant melanoma, and those are two different things. Um, so those are the majority. Nodular is one with a very quick uh, vertical phase of growth. Desmoplastic forms a lot of scarring. It's actually very difficult to spot. It looks more like a scar. It's not always pigmented. Acrolentigenous is on the, the palms and underneath the nails, and um, mucosal is inside the mouth is its own, own disease, its own beast. The AJCC has its, its guidelines. Um, if I gave you time to look over it, you'd understand how we, can't, we don't have time to go through this on, this on this lecture. But essentially, the melanomas are broken up into thin, intermediate, and thick um, by the depth of their penetration, and then there's a lot of consideration given to the ulceration of the specimen. So less than one millimeter is thin, one to four is intermediate, and greater than four is thick. We then divide that up a little bit more finely and found that um, over 0.8 millimeters can be inclusive to concerns regarding lymph nodes uh, and, lymph, and lymph node spread with the cancer. And also uh, ulceration, which really changes the depth because you don't really know how deep it would have been originally. And then certainly uh, any biopsies that didn't give us the depth. Um, so they had a positive deep margin. This staging slide will also show that the number of lymph nodes that are involved is important. And what we find about melanoma is the lymph nodes can be involved without seeing gross disease, which means a big lymph node in the neck. So they can be present as a metastasis and lymph node, which can change, change all the staging and have no palpable or visible abnormalities. And therefore, we discuss uh, in a minute sentinel lymph node biopsy to try to evaluate that first lymph node that comes um, out of the um, lymph node basin from the area where the skin cancer is present. The lymph node status changes greatly the staging of, the advan of, the, the staging of their disease. So positive lymph node, multiple lymph nodes, um, in transit or satellite metastases. Satellite metastasis is a, is a lesion of melanoma that has jumped within two centimeters uh, of the original lesion, and you see like another dot within two centimeters of the original lesion. Or an in transit is somewhere between a lymph node and that area, but away from the original uh, tumor by more than two centimeters. And all these are considered in the staging. And really, most of the advances in treatment for melanoma come in the stage three and four disease, which I'll go through in a minute. So treatment of melanoma is surgical. We cut it out. 
Typically, um, um, some studies have shown uh, in Mohs micrographic resections, and it's not typically treated with Mohs, but Mohs micrographic resections have shown that kind of the optimal distance for resection is about 12 millimeters, but somewhere between one and two centimeters typically. And um, we do have a version of Mohs micrographic surgery where we resect it, wait 24 hours, stain it, leave the wound open, and then re-resect it. But generally, cutting it out is, is, is the principle and with a two centimeter margin. But we need to know if it went to any lymph nodes, because I told you it'll go to a lymph node and not show an abnormal lymph node. So uh, surgery is the mainstay treatment. Then biopsying a lymph node to make sure that a lymph node isn't involved. If it is greater than 0.8 millimeters in depth, or it, isn't, it doesn't have the presence of ulceration, or I'm sorry, or if it does have the presence of ulceration. Um, T1B is kind of uh, an area uh, which is that 0.8 uh, to one millimeter depth where you have to talk with the patient and to see if they want to do the central lymph node. But really we push for that one to four millimeter thickness to be the, the, the um, depth where the central lymph node is, is important. And that's based upon a study done called the multi, uh, uh, um, multi-selective lymphadenectomy trial, which was done in 2005, which showed that these central lymph nodes not only change their prognosis and change our treatment, but also incre- improve disease-free uh, survival for patients. So we do a sentinel lymph node when we find the, the tumor, if it meets those indications. And how do we do that? We inject them with some radioactive dye, technetium-99 sulfur colloid, 0.2 mLs, usually tangentially placed into the skin so that there's no collapse of the lymphatics. And we use a radioactive probe called a gamma probe to measure the radioactivity counts per minute in order to um, make sure that we have the lymph node of biggest concern. Then we use a single positron emission CT to localize the lymph nodes so we can have a minimally invasive approach. So here's a lady who had a melanoma in her right temple. It's that red dot in the middle of all my markings. And it was biopsied and shown to have uh, about a 1.2 millimeter depth. And so we had her injected with the technetium 99 sulfur colloid. We marked out two areas of lymph nodes, one of which was in the parotid gland. And then I planned out my resection as well as the advancement flaps. And I used that lower flap, which is flap meaning raising the skin, I use that lower entrance area to access those lymph nodes uh, in that region. So if we get somebody who has skin cancer, or sorry, melanoma, and we resect it, and it was of a thickness um, under four millimeters where we um, uh, think we have the best effect to evaluate um, uh, the sentinel lymph node. If we get a sentinel lymph node back that doesn't have any abnormalities in it, then we closely follow these patients. We do serial ultrasounds and watch them closely. But the ones who have a positive lymph node, or more than one positive lymph node, or even evidence of these in-transit or satellite metastases, they are now entering into a, a little bit uh, different stage of the disease. And at stage three and four disease, we have um, systemic therapies that can help them. And this has really changed everything for melanoma, at least for now. There are two types of therapies, and they're both um, uh, immunologic type uh, modulating therapies. Um, the programmed uh, cell death receptors and the cytotoxic, cytotoxic T, lymphocyte angio, uh, or T lymphocyte antigen receptors are, 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 part, are, are two receptors that affect a, a signaling pathway that tells our T cells to get active or to kind of mellow out. And then BRAF and MEK are two other genes that help the signaling pathway called the MAP kinase pathway, and they also activate cell turnover. And so we found that these patients had uh, some genetic defects in in some of these regions. And so um, when we have someone with advanced disease, we're able to actually turn up their cells to go attack and kill their cancer. So after starting these therapies, we've had the ability to raise that one year kind of very, very morbid outcome of most people dying within one year for stage four disease to up to uh, 50% of people uh, living five years with some very advanced disease. So the first therapy, when we have someone who has positive lymph node metastases and and the melanoma has advanced, is the BRAF and MEK inhibitors. So we take the melanoma tissue, we send it for testing, they look for a BRAF gene mutation or MEK gene mutation, and then if they have those mutations, they'll be a candidate for um, two sets of drugs, either dibrafenib and trametinib, or vimurefenib and cobimetinib. 
they together have about a 30 to 40 percent five year survival when people are in advanced disease and they're given these drugs. And so they've had quite a, an effect in allowing people to live longer and some people having complete remissions of their disease. The second combo, uh, vemurafenib and cobimetinib, are pills, which is kind of nice. Um, but they have their, their downsides. I'll talk about those in a second. The checkpoint inhibitors include the program cell death inhibitors and the CTLA inhibitors. That includes ipilimumab, nivolumab, and um, uh, um, pembrolizumab. And the different studies have shown um, different efficacy of each of these things, and they are um, usually chosen by the oncologist. But for stage three, often op, uh, nivolumab, Opdivo is used, and for stage four, um, a combo of, of Yervoy and Opdivo called nivolumab and ipilimumab. Um, but what they all have is the potential of kind of labeled immune-related adverse events. And I kind of liken it to graft versus host reactions with people who've had bone marrow transplants. Their body is turning on them, and they're having a basically severe autoimmune reaction because they've turned on these T cells, and now they're not just attacking the tumor, they're attacking other parts of their body, their skin, their organs, endocrine. So that's a small percentage, but enough of a percentage that, that it leads to a lot of people not being able to complete the treatment. So I think the future is going to be trying to find drugs that do this without the severity of those adverse events. Because if they have that adverse event, then they have to go on immunosuppressives, which basically make their disease have the ability to grow even faster. So it's a great advance, and they're certainly standard of, of care for right now for those advanced diseases, but there's more work to be done. And I put down there, in the 1970s, decarbazine, uh, the original um, uh, chemotherapeutic given for systemically uh, spread melanoma only worked on 10% of patients, and, and the FDA approved that. So I think we've come a long ways. Next, we're going to talk about cutaneous sarcomas. This is a very small percentage, but when you deal with it, you can see it's, it, it really affects people quite dramatically. Um, the most common I see would be dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, DFSP, and atypical fibrosanthoma. The, we, we, I do see occasional pleomorphic dermal sarcoma, also used to be known as malignant fibrous histiocytoma. And then these other two, leomyosarcoma, angiosarcoma, you'll see those occasionally, and they're, they're very, very um, severe disease, diseases that advance quickly. But DFSP will be the first one we talk about. Typically with these, as the sarcoma will take very wide margins and often consider some adjunctive therapies. So here's DFSP. This was a gentleman who had been in the military and 10 years prior had... Um, a doc look at a lesion on his face. It looked fine, felt it, it was kind of hard, and, they, and he said, well, that's, that's fine. That's just a little skin thing. You'll be fine. Ten years later, it had grown to what I marked out here. So you can't see it, but I've marked out where I felt the borders of this kind of hard, indurated skin that clearly wasn't infected. Um, let me see if I say anything else here. Uh, yep. So um, we didn't, with him, I said, well, we'll take a biopsy and we'll also um, do this intraoperatively and I'll just resect it. And so I took the biopsy and immediately um, the pathologist said, this is a sarcoma and it's at the edges of everything you resected. So then I did another resection, another resection, and it just kind of heralds to what happens with these, subcutane these cutaneous sarcomas is the area of involvement is much bigger than the originally marked area. And so you can see on the top left, the area of involvement. And then my planned reconstruction, was, which was a rotation flap with a little Z-plasty. My Z-plasty isn't as pretty as I would have originally liked it to be, but it certainly, um, I saw him back just a, a few months ago, and he looks great. And, uh, and, um, um, and of course, he doesn't feel like he, you know, he would rather not have had to go through this, but I think it's, it's healed quite well. Um, atypical fibrosanthoma is kind of an early version of pleom uh, pleom uh, pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. It's usually a little bit more uh, benign. Um, and uh, like DFSP, which I didn't mention, doesn't usually go to lymph nodes. This one rarely goes to lymph nodes. Usually an older person pops up really quickly. It's really ugly looking um, when it comes up and you have to take a one centimeter margin, but rarely goes to any lymph nodes. Um, so we'll talk, we're going to change from the other sarcomas into kind of its, uh, its own category, Merkel cell carcinoma. It's a neuroendocrine skin tumor. It's really um, um, uh, likely generated from the Merkel cell polyoma virus. As that's found, uh, that viral genome is found in 80% of all these skin cancers. And uh, it's extremely aggressive at times. Um, surgical excision is the mainstay treatment with, with a, a fairly good margin, a, a, a one to two centimeter margin. 
And um, when it's greater than one centimeter, we definitely want to evaluate the lymph node um, as that can be a significant change on its um, uh, um, treatment plan. So typically it will involve a uh, resection with a um, sentinel lymph node biopsy. If the lymph node is positive, then you may decide to do a lymph node dissection of the neck, um, but um, radiation is actually shown to be more efficacious than uh, the neck dissection, and radi- uh, neck dissection by itself. So commonly, um, it'll be offered to the patient to do a neck dissection, which, remo- which means removing the lymph nodes in the neck that's involved with this. But uh, radiation is really important uh, of that nodal basin, and then, and then we always radiate the original primary site. Um, Chemotherapy has been given for this. Um, recently, nivolumab, which is um, one of those checkpoint inhibitors, has shown uh, a pretty good response rate. I had a patient uh, last year who was given this as a, um, a neoadjuvant therapy, an upfront therapy, and um, we didn't have to uh, uh, do uh, lymph node dissection or neck dissection, even though he had positive lymph nodes, because it all regressed. I haven't seen him back since, so I think he's doing well, actually. Okay. This is the kind of opposite end of the spectrum. This is a patient of mine who had very severe skin disease, had recurred despite someone else's previous attempt to remove it. I marked on the bottom the resection area, the neck dissection, and the pectoralis flap I I performed. My wife thought the pictures probably weren't necessary for this slide, so I I left them out. But um, I can tell you it was quite a dissection, a lot of work to try to help this wonderful gentleman. And eventually, um, a time later, he did... um, succumb to disease. So in conclusion, for skin cancer, prevention is the best treatment. Um, Avoid tanning boosts, period. Um, Squamous cell needs to be given um, quite a bit of attention because, again, it has almost an equivalent um, um, loss of life to melanoma, but it just, sometimes it's like, oh, that's the squamous cell, it'll be fine. You still need to give it a lot of attention. Um, Melanoma's advanced disease has um, uh, quite an advance in treatment, and so I don't think it quite has the same stigma of, of being a death sentence that it, that it did before. Um, and Merkel cell is its own category. Um, thank you. Okay. So sentinel lymph node biopsy um, primarily is reserved for the melanomas, and we actually don't do Mohs micrographic surgery at the time of resection for the melanoma. We'll do the resection in the OR with a very wide margin and a sentinel lymph node biopsy um, at the same time. And they're injected in the morning, they come to the OR, I resect and do the lymph node biopsy that day. The squamous cell is a little different, and so if you get a biopsy of a very large squamous cell, and it has a, maybe a poor histologic variant, and uh, if you did a full thickness, you can so, show some fatty invasion or perineural invasion. You kind of have a clue that this is a little bit more than just your typical um, Mohs micrographic surgery. And typically, I would probably resect those in the OR with a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Um, so Mohs micrographic is really, um, primarily its workhorse use is in basal cells and squamous cells that aren't quite in those categories, if that answers the question. All right, thank you.